But I guess we're going to bring in the man who is uh, what an axe thrower um, down. <laughs> Alex Chamberlain, how you doing? I'm good, man. How are you doing? What What is this? Oh, my God. What, what is this room? The shirt? The, the, the echo? The, uh, this is not the Alex Chamberlain. Oh, should I put my headphones in? I know. I'm sorry. This is, well, I, I so I'm in a new house, in a new okay. room. I got yeah. vaulted ceilings for the acoustics. Yeah. Love it. Love um, it. But obviously the acoustics are bad. Too. I've got two. This is not what I'm used to. I'm also used to the glasses. The uh... I got LASIK. Um, I got Congrats. no glasses. I'm wearing a shirt. Uh-huh. Um, I'm a new man. <laughs> That's right. That I'm is a like new a <laughs> Forgot that part. Right. He's wearing his shirt, of course. Yeah. Um, yeah. So how uh, if you guys on Twitch right now, if you want to place your bets, you can on at what point in this presentation Alex Chamberlain is going to remove his shirt. That's uh, fair. Go right ahead right now. Yeah. Um, yeah. I usually I, I start to run hot. I get nervous. Uh my you know, my my body temperature rises, I start to sweat. Um, and if I don't take my shirt off, I start to feel claustrophobic, but it's a little chilly today. Mm. So it might stay on. We'll see. Look, I, I put on the sweatshirt. I couldn't do it. My radiator is too loud for this. So I'm dealing with this now. Um, but uh, it's a fantastic shirt. I'm looking forward to this presentation a lot. Uh, if you want to share it with me inside of StreamYard, I can push it up. Yeah. Yeah. Lot, yeah. yeah. But, but seriously, uh, is my um yeah. is my is my audio bad? Should I put in some headphones? Oh no, you're good. You're good. Don't okay, worry. Okay, okay. I'll just make it um, funny for a second. Okay, because I I so my headphones have been really bad. Like my my I've been using my employer's headphones. Don't tell them. Um, but they suck. They're super <laughs> bad. They keep cutting out. Like I'm, I'll be on like client calls and mm. and I'll just be super embarrassed. I gotta be like, okay, I can't hear anyone anymore. So I don't want to rely on those headphones, and I don't sure. have anything else that's even you halfway good. Um, so let's do it. It's better than we last year because last year my, my internet wasn't working for the first 15 minutes. Do you remember that? Oh, I do. I do remember that. It was that. really stressful. I was like um, almost at the brink of tears. I was so stressed out. And huge shout out to uh, to Fir Tree right now for actually setting up that prediction inside of Twitch. So legitimately, it is a thing that you can bet on. Are you going to do it or not? Do it. Uh, make sure you're on twitch.tv slash pitcherless to engage with the chat. Uh, but all right, I'll let you go ahead and do it. Thanks so much for being a part of PitchCon, Alex. Yeah, of course. Thanks for having me. So uh, this, I don't know what Nick called it. It was like pitch height and launch angle from the pitcher's perspective. That is that is what this is about. Um, I've kind of tweaked the title because it's it kind of is a sprawling subject. Um, so pitch height, launch angle, um, quote, contact management. Where are my, where are my air quotes? There are contact management. Um, and the FIP slash FIP framework. Um, yeah, uh, pitch height has been bothering me for like three or four years now. Um, it's something that I really looked at earnestly in like 2019 or 2020. And ever since then, I just, I really haven't been able to shake it. Um, it is like the one topic that keeps me up at night, um, only metaphorically. Uh, my daughter is actually the one who keeps me up at night. Um, but this uh, is, is like the one topic that I, I feel like I can't stop thinking about. Um, I feel like it really demystifies a lot about um, pitching success. And, and I think it also demystifies some things on the hitter side as well. Um, but <clears throat> excuse me, um, we can hop straight into it. Um, I'm going to try to uh, elaborate about the importance of pitch height um, or just when I say pitch height, I mean like vertical pitch location, but it, it's 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 a little smoother to say pitch height. So when I'm talking about pitch height, I mean just, you know, up and down location vertically um, and, and how that relates to launch angle, but also how it relates to this kind of nebulous idea of contact management and, and overall pitcher success. Uh, uh, there we go. So um, yeah, contact management has always been a, a fickle, elusive thing. Um, you know, we talk about guys being contact managers and, um, there is some kind of, I think we have like ideas attributed to that. Um, primarily, like we really like guys who are ground ball pitchers. Um, that kind of has long been a preference, at least among fantasy baseball players. But I think even among, you know, just, just casual or not, I shouldn't say casual, but like, you know, the, the sabermetric crowd that doesn't play fantasy baseball, um, uh, you know, ground ball pitchers have always been intriguing because of their ability to seemingly um, manage contact, but, um, you know, it's not just about ground balls. 
Um, and I think that's one of the big kind of misnomers about contact management. It's about many other things. Um, but let's talk about some kind of high level facts. And I don't have the links to these articles in here because you can't click them because you're watching a presentation. Um, but it's been shown um, specifically by Rob Arthur in 2015 at 538 um, that hitters exert a majority influence on exit velocity outcomes. Um, if we step back to think about it, it makes a lot of sense. Like if hitters weren't exerting a majority influence on EV outcomes, um, all hitters would look the same, you know, like David Fletcher and Aaron judge would not be significantly different if they weren't the ones exerting that influence on the EV outcome. So like Arthur had shown that it was roughly like, it was more than 80%, maybe like 85% of EV comes from uh, comes from the hitter, uh, so to speak. Now that, that study was done in 2015 and that's kind of with like the fledgling StatCast data. So um, it's entirely possible that those numbers are a little bit different these days. Um, I would guess that it's even more in favor of hitters than was previously said, just because of the sheer reliance on exit velocity nowadays. Like I just think, you know, now compared to 2015, hitters are hitting the absolute snot out of the ball. Um, and they are really overcoming a lot of the shortcomings of being uh, like a swing and miss hitter. Like I just remember there was, you know, four, four or five years ago or whenever Tatis um, debuted, his his plate discipline numbers were so, they seemed prohibitively bad, but his, his contact quality was so, so, so good that he was able to overcome like a 30% strikeout rate at AAA. And, and you know, he's, he's clearly become one of the better players. Um, of this young and, and upcoming generation of, of hitters. So um, I'm rambling a little bit, but you know, the, if hitters are exerting an, a majority influence on exit velocity, then, then pitchers don't really exert much influence on it at all. Um, where they do exert some influence is, is mostly just from physics. Um, it's a, a pitch velocity thing. So like if you're throwing a slower pitch, it's gonna be a little bit harder to hit that ball harder because that's physics. Like I'm not a physicist, but that's just how it works. Don't, don't ask me, go ask a physicist. Um, and location, like, uh, you know, if, if the pitch is in a, a suboptimal location, like way outside the zone, or even just anywhere that's deviating from the heart of the zone, um, it's just going to be a little bit harder to muster uh, an optimal exit velocity. So um, we do see pitchers um, exerting some influence on exit velocity, and that will come into play um, down the road in this presentation, um, someone like Ryan Yarbrough comes to mind. Um, that is both uh, a pitch velocity and a location thing. He has been the best pitcher of the past few years at um, at dampening, is the word I like to use, dampening hitter exit velocity. He's able to take like four to five miles per hour off of a hitter's exit velocity um, on average. And that's just across all hitters. So, you know, like he's turning judge from like a 94, five EV guy to a 90 EV guy and David Fletcher from an 80 EV guy to a 75 EV guy. So um, I'm dramatically oversimplifying how we talk about hitters in terms of their exit velocities, but that's just kind of how this all shakes out. Pitchers just don't really have a lot of control over what that exit velocity looks like. And of course, um, Tom Tango and others have shown that exit velocity is the most predictive of hitter success. So um that kind of begs the question, like, what's the most predictive of pitcher success? And this is something that we've been grappling with for years and years. Um, launch angle, despite exit velocity being important, um, launch angle is still really important. And um, I think it kind of comes down to this, like, naturally occurring dichotomy um, of things that are, are predictive tend to be less descriptive uh, and vice versa. So, like, when we're talking about uh, certain ERA estimators or certain metrics being more predictive, they oftentimes tend to be more, I'm sorry, they tend to be um, less descriptive of the current year outcomes. Launch angle seems to be the, the metric compared to exit velocity that has a larger influence on the actual outcomes that we see day to day, game to game, at bat to at bat. And, and that kind of it kind of establishes a, a, a catch 22 again, because like EV is the primary skill uh, and yet launch angle is the one that is determining a lot of what's happening on the field. 
because a lot of launch angles don't really care about exit velocity. Pop-ups, um, extreme fly balls, pop-ups are almost always automatic outs. Um, ground balls are low probability hits regardless of their exit velocity. Um, you know, there's a little bit of wiggle room there where like a harder exit velocity um, will push a ground ball through more quickly and increase that probability of a hit. But really, it doesn't increase the probability of it being a double or a triple or a home run. Like really, when we're talking about ground balls, you're talking about singles. You're talking about lots of outs at first base. Um, it's just kind of the way it goes. And you can be Vlad Guerrero Jr., hitting 118 mile per hour ground balls. Uh, and that's still a ground ball, you know, um, and line drives are high probability hits regardless of their exit velocity. We're talking about um, really like flyers, like the things that are dropping in below or in front of the outfielders and stuff that's going to the gaps. And like, these are mostly doubles. Like it's just, and they just, regardless of how hard you hit them, they find a way to fall in. Like high, line drives just happen to be the most productive type of hit. And so we have like, most of our launch angles covered by these three kinds of categories of hits or batted balls that don't really need to rely on exit velocity much at all. So that's why we kind of have this like push and pull of like exit velocity is really good and you want to be a, a harder hitter, but launch angle is so, so important. Like you'd rather be Aaron Judge, who is really like a line drive hitter um, with massive power than be uh, Joey Gallo, who has possibly the same power, but only hits pop ups. So where's my mouse? Right. So I've kind of spoiled this slide by getting ahead of myself. But if EV is predictive, then LA is kind of descriptive. Um, and so we've talked about briefly how uh, pitchers don't exert any influence over exit velocity. They do a little bit, um, but they really exert their influence over launch angle, which is super, super critical because, as I just discussed, most batted balls are subject to whatever the launch angle is more so than the exit velocity. Um, and so pitchers uh, exert that influence over launch angle primarily through pitch location and within pitch location, primarily uh, through pitch height. Um, that's the crux of all of this. Launch angle, batted ball percentages, they behave generally in a linear fashion um, with pitch height, if you're talking about going from the bottom of the zone to the top of the zone, you can mathematically quantify like what are um, the the percentage chances of inducing a certain type of batted ball or like what the average launch angle should be based on the height of the pitch. I feel like this is something that's very intuitive, but really just was never something that was talked about. Um, and I think back to uh, what was called the launch angle revolution. And we really struggled to quantify like why hitters were hitting more home runs, um, why there were more strikeouts, um, but we weren't seeing like specific hitters launch angles changing a lot. We weren't seeing really like the distribution of launch angles changing a whole lot. Um, but pitch height is super, super critical in that regard. That was one of the key components that we just didn't look at more closely enough to say like, okay, pitch fastballs being thrown at the top of the zone are getting more whiffs. Um, fastballs being thrown at the top of the zone are allowing more home runs. Like it became really simple once at least I started to think about it more critically through the lens of pitch location rather than hitters changing their swings to try to hit home runs on a widespread basis. And, and I remember one of the quotes that really got me thinking against this was like someone asked Christian Yelich about his launch angle swing uh, and he just scoffed. He's like, what the hell's a launch angle swing? Um, I don't change my swing. Uh, and probably that same year he hit a home run off a fastball like this high, like it probably would have hit him in the nose if it was inside. And he just like threw his bat up there and he skied it and it just like barely cleared the left field wall. Now that's when the ball was super bouncy, but at the same time, he went from being a hitter who was teeing off or I shouldn't say teeing off because he wasn't really hitting for much power at all before his power outburst, but he was definitely hitting balls lower in the zone. And as years went by, he was kind of moving his approach up and whether he was adjusting that approach to meet what pitchers were doing or just making a conscious effort to make different swing decisions. That's a lot of what changed his level of success from being a solid regular outfielder who could hit 10 to 15 home runs to being a guy who hit like 40 
overnight and then lost that. So we'll talk about that another time. So swing decisions are super important. Um, and a hitter's launch angle is affected by like what, what pitches he's swinging at. Like he can have the same bat plane. Um, but if he's facing Framber Valdez and only, or if he's, is he, if he's only facing Framber Valdez 500 times and like, uh, Christian Javier 500 times, he's going to have dramatically different launch angles despite having the same exact swing or like kind of like swing plane or bat path against both of them. So pitch height is super important um, on the hitter side and the pitcher side, but we're talking about pitchers here. So let's stop talking about hitters, Alex. What are you doing? This is my only graphic. Um, and I don't like it because pitch height is, is the X axis technically. I mean, it's the Y axis, but because we have two X axes, it put them on the sides. Anyway, if you turn it sideways, like pitch height is going left to right, but if we turned it sideways and so it's going up to down, that'd make a little more sense. You can see that, um, you can see like the, the breakdown of, of batted ball types by pitch height. And you can see just how much they change when you're going from the bottom of the zone to the top of the zone. Um, you know, a ground ball pitcher is not a ground ball pitcher just by virtue of like the kinds of pitches he throws. It's a matter of where he's throwing those pitches to. And of course, this is all so, so intuitive, I think. Um, you know, it, this has always been um, just kind of like at the tips of our tongues in terms of how we're talking about pitchers. But like, you can really see, like, <laughs> you you can you can change a pitcher completely in terms of the success that he's having just by talking about the locations that he's hitting. Um, stuff is super important, and again, we'll get to that too. But like, location, 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 really, really important. Um, this begets like this begets a huge conversation about. Uh, about command, and I don't really want to like relitigate what command is, but to me, like I don't think it's really necessarily about hitting s particular spots as much as it is just elevating and burying at the right times against the right hitters with the right pitches. I mean, I, I don't think it really has to be so pinpoint. Um, and uh, you know, if you are someone like Framber Valdez or Christian Javier who is just doing a good job of repeatedly throwing your, you know, your four seamer at the top of the zone or, or, or burying your sinker um, at the bottom of the zone uh, and, and, and leveraging kind of like the pitch shape, um, like the optimal pitch shape that you have, that you have created and pairing that with pitch height, um, you can find a lot of success. So um, on the, on the side, I have some, some metrics that is, is simplifying what you're seeing to the left. Um, for every one inch of height, and, and again, that just means vertical pitch location. So if I'm saying one inch of height, I'm just saying if you throw that pitch one inch higher than than your previous pitch, you can expect the hitter's launch angle to increase by a little more than one degree. Um, that means like over a foot, you might gain 14 degrees of launch angle and between the bottom and the top of the strike zone, at least as it's defined by StatCast, you're talking about like a 28 degree difference in launch angle. That's a huge, huge difference. I mean, that's why we see so many um so many different types of pitchers and you know a lot of it is based again based on the types of pitches that they're throwing but a lot of it is location too uh and i will say that a lot of pitchers are bad like just genuinely bad at hitting locations like it shouldn't be it's sh i feel like there should be more success uh in major league pitching and maybe i just don't know how dang hard it is to pitch because i never did it um, but you know, these guys are professionals and still they struggle to, to hit their spots up and down and are leaving things out in the open over the plate and are allowing line drives and fly balls, the most damaging kinds, um, of batted balls. Um, but you can see on the side that, uh, you know, if you're, if you're locating at the bottom of the zone consistently, you are, um, you're giving yourself like a 55% chance of inducing a ground ball. And that's just on average. Again, like this is. This is agnostic of the types of pitches that you're throwing. Um, this is agnostic of the shapes of the pitches that you're throwing. Um, Framber Valdez has much more steepness, so to speak, than many other pitchers who are throwing at the bottom of the zone. Um, and at the top of the zone, you will find pop-ups like four times more often than you will at the bottom of the zone. Um, so again, this is just like pretty straightforward stuff, but it's really crucial in how we evaluate certain players because I think the existing frameworks that we have don't really appreciate that inducing these extreme kinds of batted ball outcomes can be skill-based. Um, I think 
you know, we'll, we'll get to that in a second um, because the next slide talks about it. Um, if you use a regression analysis, which we don't have to do, like this is not something that is so complicated that you need to use rigorous statistical analysis to figure it out. But I think you can just see visually uh, when you're looking at the top and the bottom of the zone or just at pitch height in general, it's the ground balls and the pop-ups that are changing the most based on the pitch height. Um, line drives is like the same solid yellow chunk all the way through. There is a little bit of difference in fly ball rate, depending on where you're throwing it. There are more fly balls found at the top of the zone than the bottom. Um, but really, it's it's the extreme values that are being affected most by pitch height. Uh, and again, that's really critical because pitch height, and I'm gonna keep I'm gonna keep repeating this point over and over just to make sure it gets through. Um, pitch height is the thing that a, a pitcher can control, and pitch height is the thing that affects the ground balls, the rate of ground balls and pop-ups that a pitcher is inducing. And in addition to that, pop-ups and ground balls are the most optimal outcomes for a pitcher on the batted ball side of things, you know, ignoring strikeouts and and walks. So you're talking about this like this kind of line that you can draw straight through from pitch height being a controllable skill to pitch height inducing particularly good outcomes that re that result in automatic outs or just really low variance kinds of outcomes. Again, ground balls are lots of outs and some singles, but little else. You know, you're you're really talking about a pitcher having a possibility of owning this kind of BABIP reducing skill. And that's like one of the big issues with FIP um, is relates to BABIP, but you can kind of draw that line straight through to say, yeah, I mean, if a pitcher is repeatedly hitting his spots up in the zone or down in the zone and he's inducing extreme batted ball outcomes, then we should be rewarding him for that. So we'll get to that in a second. Um, this is a real quick thought about the line drive percentage though. Um, and for a long time, we've had a hard time explaining why hitters or I'm sorry, pitchers may or may not have a better line drive rate in one year and the other and not in the other, but it really is just like a matter of luck. Like you can see basically at any spot in the zone, line drive rate stays the same. If you run a regression analysis, again, you, this is something you don't need to do, um, but it is really illuminating because if you do regress line drive rate against pitch height, it'll tell you there's absolutely no relationship. And that's really important because <laughs> And so everything that we know about line drive rate, like there's just no relationship year to year. Um, a pitcher who has a better line drive rate in one year and not the other is probably subject to having some regression or reversion back to like what their previously stated, you know, previously established line drive rate was or the league average line drive rate. Um, so it just kind of like validates all everything that we know about line drive rate in terms of um, how fickle it is. Um, and, and how hard it is con to control. And also it is like the most common kind of outcome just by virtue of there being, just by again, by virtue of physics again, because pitches are flat and swings are flat and you have two flat things joining each other or, you know, to, um, conjoining at the plate of, at the point of contact and creating a flat line drive outcome. So again, it's not that simple, but the physics kind of established that like line drives are actually the most common outcome. It's just that baseball is so hard <laughs> that it, it really attests to the fact that like there, if there were more line drive outcomes, we would know that the sport is a little too easy. Um, so the fact that there's not more line drives, just again, based on the sheer physics of flat pitches meeting flat swings really attests to like how, how hard baseball is. And that's good because baseball being hard and unpredictable makes it exciting. It's just really hard to, to kind of grapple with it from a fantasy baseball standpoint. So this brings me back to the FIP framework. FIP meaning fielding independent base or fielding, fielding independent pitching. Um, so for those of you not familiar with like the intricacies of the FIP framework, it basically tries to attribute skills to the pitcher by reduce, by removing the fielding element of pitching entirely. So uh, FIP, FIP, the original FIP, um, it rewards and punishes pitchers according to uh, strikeouts, walks, and home runs. So again, nothing that's happening in the field of play. 
um, XFIP is replacing home runs with fly balls. And so again, fly balls are actually in the field of play now, and this is important to remember. Fly balls are in the field of play, but we're, we're replacing home runs with fly balls and then multiplying that fly ball rate with the league average rate of home runs to fly balls. So it's kind of like saying pitchers don't have control over the rate of home runs that they allow, but they do have control over the rate of fly balls they allow. So that is an interesting step forward. Um, and it kind of changes the meaning of FIP a little bit, again, which is important to consider based on what I plan to propose in about two seconds. And uh, and then Sierra is not really important. It's, it's kind of immaterial to the FIP framework because it's not really considering these assumptions. But um, what, what it boils down to is uh, FIP is saying that the average pitcher does not really have any control over his BABIP, his batting average on balls in play. He really has no control over what's happening in the field. And frankly, that is just not true. Um, there are quite a few types of batted balls that enter the field of play that, again, don't require a lot of fielding skill. So pop-ups, namely. Um, I'm not saying that any dullard who steps on the baseball diamond can field a ground ball, but it's a very low variance outcome. It's really prone and sub or like kind of vulnerable to just where uh, the fielder is standing um, and less so like, and the angle, like the spray angle of the hit and not so much like the exit velocity or the, the particular launch angle, like it's on the ground. So it's really just a matter of getting it through those holes in the infield. Excuse me. So FIP fails to reward pitchers for that skill. And so um, I think, you know, for me, the logical extension of this is if you have a pitcher who can locate adeptly, um, induce those extreme value launch angles that result in really low value hits or batted balls on the hitter side, that should be rewarded and you can reward that by including it in FIP. Like I think, um, you know, if you are, if you are talking about pop-ups being independent of fielding, like you're basically taking fielding out of the equation. They're, they're, they're outs 98, 99% of the time. Like really they only fall because of, of miscommunication. Um, and, and again, ground balls are not automatic outs, but they're so low variance that we can reliably estimate the amount of damage that they're going to do. Um, and if a pitcher is consistently inducing ground balls, you know, unless his infield is really terrible or really good, and you're going to see some differences there based on the, the quality of the infielders, we can pretty reliably estimate like the amount of damage that ground balls are going to inflict on a pitcher. Um, much more reliably than we can fly balls or line drives. And, and again, fly balls are what is currently in FIP. So we are, you know, the original, the existing FIP framework is inviting kind of, is in, it's inviting variance and it's inviting um, things that are difficult to estimate when we have things that are not only easier to estimate, but easier to attribute as a skill based on things that the pitcher can control, which is the height of his pitches. So um, it, the way that I think about it is like, it doesn't have to be completely independent of fielding. Um, if you lead the horse to water, you should be rewarded for that, even if the horse won't drink. And in this stupid metaphor, the fielders are the horse. Um, if they can't field the ball, that's not really the pitcher's fault. If he's inducing ground balls, they, you know, he's doing the best he can to, to set up the fielders as much as they can for success and pop-ups are the same thing. I mean, if they drop a pop-up, like what the heck can you do? But 99% of the time pop-ups are out. So again, this is a, a lead the horse to water kind of situation where you don't have to remove all fielding outcomes because there are ways to not only include them, but reward pitchers accordingly for that. So, Oh, this is like embarrassing and ironic. Um, I, I probably introduced a, a, an ERA estimator two years ago or three years ago. Um, it wasn't as thoughtful as this. Like the one that I, I introduced three years ago was really just 
an attempt to make the most descriptive ERA estimator. I was dissatisfied with FIP. I just wanted to know what should have happened. There are better ways to do it than what's currently out there. This is different. Um, what I want to do is just overhaul FIP. And uh, I'm calling it predictive FIP because I don't, I'm not very creative. I don't really know what else to call it. Um, and it's kind of giving away the outcome here because uh, it is more predictive than FIP, XFIP, or Sierra. And it's not anything particularly complicated. I mean, the numbers look complicated. Uh, and that's because regression analysis can be moderately complicated. But from a theoretical standpoint, we're just replacing the home runs and or fly ball component of FIP and inserting ground balls and pop-ups. Again, ground balls and pop-ups being things that pitchers control by virtue of their pitch height. Um, and just including these in FIP creates a better version of FIP. Like it was, it's that easy. And, I, and it's not something that I'm like going to like toot my own horn about. I think anyone could have done this and found the same thing. I think the part that makes me want to toot my own horn is that it's, it's, it's theoretically sound and that we have evidence to prove that, you know, we're not just throwing variables into a blender and saying, okay, this is the best, this is the best ERA estimator because I threw a hundred variables into uh, a principal component analysis and found what's best. Um, and this is what's going to be the best predictor of pitcher success. But, you know, we're seeing based on evidence that like a pitcher can control to some extent, the launch angles that he allows. And some of those launch angles are really weak and advantageous to the pitcher. Um, and we should reward him for that. So PFIP does that. Um, and it's better than FIP predictively. It's better than XFIP predictively. Um, and it's stickier, which means it's better at predicting itself. And again, this is not like me tooting my own horn. This is just an extension of the theory. And this is just putting the theory into practice and showing that like, yeah, pop-ups and ground balls are a skill that the pitcher owns. He owns them from year to year, uh, and it affects the outcomes that he's seeing on the field year to year too. So, um, yeah, I've already I've already kind of discussed these talking points here. Pop-ups are, um, oh, I haven't talked to specifically to these points here, um, but we can see that pop-ups being auto nearly automatic outs are almost as valuable as strikeouts. So the coefficient, the number that's in front of each of these terms here kind of determines the magnitude of the importance. And we can see that pop-ups are almost as good as strikeouts, which is kind of what we know in real life. Um, you know, a pop-up is almost an automatic out. Um, and we can see that ground balls are a little less valuable and that's because ground balls are hits sometimes. They're just hits like 20 to 24% of the time, roughly. Um, and as such, they shouldn't be valued nearly as highly as a pop-up. Now, the one thing that's flawed about this and remains flawed about, um, about FIP in general is that we don't account for um, EV quality, EV influence. This is the stuff that we talked about at the very beginning where pitchers do have like a very small influence on exit velocity through their pitch speeds, through their pitch location, uh, in a small way through their stuff. Um, so I, the, you know, it's not going to surprise you that incorporating some component of exit velocity into an ERA estimator is going to measurably improve um, what the estimator is estimating, which is ERA. Can you believe it? But if we're in introducing EV influence, uh, and EV influence is just kind of my metric for saying how many miles per hour is a pitcher adding or taking off of a hitter's naturally occurring exit velocity. This is really like the same thing as the launch angle equation. We're talking about like, you know, the difference between launch angles up and uh, up and down in the zone are, you know, we're not talking about like what launch angle he's going to induce based on his pitch height. We're talking about what is, how, how many, Angle, or how many degrees is he going to add or subtract from the hitter's launch angle? Um, what is the probability that he's going to induce an extreme launch angle based on the hitter's kind of naturally occurring launch angle, based on his 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 bat path and the pitch height that the you know the height that the pitch was thrown at? So um, EV influence is saying, okay, so you know you see someone like Ryan Yarbrough 
on average, he's adding, I'm sorry, excuse me, he's, he's subtracting about four to five miles per hour from, from hitter EV. Um, that's really big. Like that's the most in baseball. Um, and based on the, the coefficient here, 0.19, that means if you're, if you are taking four miles per hour off of the hitters naturally occurring exit velocity, you're taking 0.75 runs away from your ERA. So for each, each mile per hour that you're adding or subtracting is roughly 0.2 runs. And if you can remove four miles per hour, even five miles per hour of EV from a hitter's, you know, from, from the hitter's naturally occurring EV, if you can make Aaron judge a 94 EV guy instead of a 99 EV guy, you're going to remove, you know, point, eight to almost a full run from your, 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 excuse me, your ERA simply by virtue of being able to dampen that EV for Yarbrough. Again, it's, it's a pitch velocity thing, but it's also a pitch location thing. He's a good pitcher. I mean, the stuff might not be good, but he has good location and he has the right velocity, which is slow um, to be able to induce kind of optimal batted ball outcomes. I mean, where he's not that good is, he, you know, it isn't, get a lot of strikeouts and that's again by virtue of his stuff so there's some give and take there but on the batted ball side of things he can be very very good so um talking kind of broadly about ev influence most pitchers just don't own it as a skill that's probably the hardest part about all of this is like you have a distribution of here's my here's my bell curve distribution of of skills um that pitchers have and we really in especially in fantasy baseball we focus on the most skilled of those pitchers um but like the vast majority of pitchers are nearly indistinguishable from one another which is sad to think about none of them are particularly good at hitting their spots none of them have particularly different or interesting stuff that would make us consider that they are better or worse at influencing exit velocity and so, uh, you know, like when we're talking about contact management, again, like there's there's really just a small number of pitchers who can do it reliably. Um, and they're the pitchers who are really good, and they're ones who would live at the extremes. It's Zach Wheeler, it's Julio Urias, it's um, it's recently, it's like Jeff Springs, um, it's Sandy Alcan Alcantara, it's, uh, it's not Kevin Gosman, it is Tyler Anderson, um, so, you know, there, there are guys who can do it reliably and repeatedly, but if you're like looking at trends on a league wide scale and saying, is contact management a thing? You're going to find out, no, it's not, but that's, that's not really, you know, accurately describing what's happening here. It, it, it is a, it is a skill and you can own it. It's just that most pitchers don't own it. Same with inducing uh, a large amount of pop-ups and ground balls. It's a skill. I mean, Framber Valdez isn't going to lose that skill unless he gets injured or, you know, over the, you know, his, his talent deteriorates over time, but that's not, he didn't lock into an 80% ground ball rate. That's a, that's a factor of, you know, his, his pitch shapes and his pitch locations. And those are things that he has control over. Um, and, he has control over those things and he weaponizes them to his advantage. And Christian Javier does the same thing at the top of the zone. Tristan McKenzie does the same thing at the top of the zone. John Means does the same thing at the top of the zone. But most pitchers don't do that. So if you're talking about, is this a skill? And you look at it, look at it as a league-wide trend, you're going to find it's not. It's not really a trend. But that's, again, that's not really accurate. Like there are guys who just do it over and over and show that they're able to do this, show that they're able to influence launch angles repeatedly and consistently, show that they're able to influence exit velocity repeatedly and consistently. It's just that you can't expect all of them to do it because they can't. They're just, frankly, not good enough to do that. So I have some names here at the bottom. I've discussed some of them already. Um, these are the biggest winners in terms of incorporating exit velocity, velocity influence. We have Chris Bassett, Wheeler, Tyler Anderson, Zach Davies, Max Freed, um, uh, uh, Ron Herr Suarez, um, Joe Musgrove. Um, these are all guys who um, are good at reducing EV, whether it's by stuff 
or whether it's just by a sheer lack of velocity. And that's kind of Zach Davies and his changeup situation. Um, these are guys who are good at doing that. And on the other side is like Sean Manaya, Herman Marquez, who is always, uh, you know, tricking us into thinking that he might be good and that he just needed to escape cores when this entire time he has always been bad at managing EV. And that's not a Coors thing. That's an everywhere thing. Um, Patrick Corbin, Nick Pavetta, who gives me nightmares and the fact that anyone's thinking about him being a good pitcher again for like the eighth year in a row gives me heartburn. Uh, and Tristan McKenzie is one that I underline here um, because uh, it, you know, he does a really good job of managing his launch angles, but actually does a really poor job of managing his exit velocity. So he is kind of like on the precipice of being good and bad at the same time. He gets lots of pop-ups, but the contact he allows is so hard that he's inducing a lot of home runs. So modified PFIP actually accounts for that. It's basically like a push-pull where it's there's actually no, no gain for him. It says that he's really good at getting all those pop-ups, but really bad at allowing EV. And what results is like basically a net zero change because it's seeing both of both of those kind of like conflicting factors um, in his 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 talent. So oh, here we are. PFIP is good and modified PFIP is good, but it's not better by that much. Why? <laughs> Predicting things is really hard. Um, it might shock you to learn that. Um, predicting things with like four variables is even harder. Um, so when we're talking about like how predictive is this compared to the other ERA, ERA estimators, it's good. It's more predictive, but there's so much of baseball that's prone to variance, prone to chance, luck, whatever you want to call it. That like, is this improvement that helpful? Personally, I think it is, and I'll get to that in a little bit, but like when we're talking about it objectively, there's still so much that we can't predict that like, why even bother predicting things, you know? It kind of gets to that existential question a little bit, but you can't bring that up to a baseball fan. It's, 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 too, it's too traumatizing, but you know what? Variance is good. It's hard for bit fantasy baseball, but it's good for the baseball watching experience because predictability is boring. So let's... Leave it at that. That's fine. I do want to say that PFIP does some things well, you know, and I've done, I've talked about all these things, but just to, just to kind of reiterate, you know, we're rewarding pitchers who excel at doing the good things within their control. Um, we are, and by we, I mean PFIP. Predictive FIP is recognizing extreme outcomes without compromising itself, which I think is possibly the most important part. And so, if you look at FIP or XFIP or Sierra, you'll see that like it tends to regress toward the mean, which is like literally what a regression does. Um, so you'll see maybe like 20 guys have an ERA below three, but you'll only see five guys with an XFIP below three. And kind of at the other end, like you'll see 30 guys with an ERA above five, but XFIP will see like five guys with an ERA above five. And it's all thinking that these guys will kind of trend towards the league average a little more. Whereas PFIP, it sees 15 guys with an ERA below, or with a with a PFIP below three and and 20 guys with a PFIP below, uh, above five. So like it is seeing those extremes more. It is seeing those extremes with more clarity and yet it's still doing a better job of predicting. So it's, it's finding a wider distribution and yet still being better at predicting ERA. That's that's really important. Um, and I don't want to get into the statistical stuff that if I'm losing you there with my distribution discussion, just know that like, you know, for the extremes, these are the guys that we're focusing on most in baseball and in fantasy baseball. I mean, these are the guys that we care about the most, the guys who are going for Cy Young awards, the guys who are going for MVP awards, the guys who are winning fantasy baseball leagues. These are the guys who exist at the extremes. So you want an ERA estimator to do its best to estimate the extreme guys. And that's what PFIP does. So I think that's probably what I'm most proud of in terms of what PFIP is uh, is is accomplishing. Um, and again, you know, PFIP is also on the flip side of that coin, avoiding the effects of batted ball outcomes that are prone to massive variance. So that's fly balls, and fly balls are the most variant of all the batted ball types. So there's a long discussion to be had about 
FIP, including home runs or including fly balls, but, and, and, you know, and the validity of doing that. And I, I think there is some validity, you know, at least as talking about coming up with this 20 years ago, like who could have known 20 years ago, but in terms of, in terms of trying to estimate things that are within the pitcher's control, fly balls are not it. Fly balls are not it. So they are the most subject to differences in EV and that's a hitter thing. And the pitcher can't control what hitters he faces. He can't control <clears throat> to a extreme degree, like what spray angles he allows. He can't control the park that he pitches in. So fly balls are really, really like the hardest things to predict. So including them in an ERA estimator is it's not a fool's errand, but it's close to it. Um, and then above all, PFIP respects the sanctity of the fielding independent kind of framework. Again, focusing on outcomes that are really easy to field, <laughs> automatic outs as pop-ups, or things that are very easy to estimate, even if they're not outs all the time. And again, that's that's ground balls. So it's just really like the confluence of a bunch of important theoretical elements linking together in such a way that like really just better explains pitching skill than any of the big three estimators that already exist. So what is a conversation about a new ERA estimator without a leaderboard? Um, you know, PFIP by and large isn't like super, super different. Again, it is a little bit better. It, it is it is better at predicting than FIP or XFIP or Sierra, but it's not like, it's not going to deviate in a big way for most pitchers. And that is probably a good thing, but I highlighted some key names um, and, and I'm just using ranks because I think using the ERA numbers is, is a little hard to digest when you're looking at like 20 different names across like six different metrics. But you can see Justin Verlander is not well liked among the XFIP and Sierra crowd, but, but PFIP rewards him for inducing a ton of pop-ups. Um, in 2019, he allowed, wait, yeah, 2019, he allowed 24 home runs on his fastball alone. And if I told you that in a vacuum, you would think Justin Verlander sucks. His fastball sucks. But he pitched a 2.58 ERA season in 2019, and he struck out like 35% of guys. So he was weaponizing a flat fastball in the top of the zone consistently, taking what, you know, hitters took what they gave him, what he gave them, excuse me. Hitters took what he gave them, which was, some home runs, yeah. And that came with the territory, but it came with tons of whiffs and tons of strikeouts and a Cy Young caliber season. So, like, you know, we freak out about home runs a little bit, and FIP is going to freak out about home runs too. If you look at his FIP from 2019, it's not good, at least not as good as his ERA. Um, but he should be rewarded, you know, he's he's he should be punished for the home runs, but he should be rewarded for those pop-ups because that's what that approach was all about. It was all about getting those, those automatic outs at the top of the zone. And that's why he had like a 220 Babbitt or something that year, because he was just getting pop-ups for days. Um, and that was, that was, again, that was part of the territory of being a fly ball pitcher is that he was also a pop-up pitcher and a strikeout pitcher. So we can see that PFIP really likes him more than, than XFIP or Sierra. Um, and same with Alcantara. Um, you know, the other ER estimators don't really see him in the same light as PFIP, and that's because they just don't respect in the same way the kinds of batted ball outcomes he's inducing because he has such elite command. Um, Kevin Gosman is not nearly as bad as any of his estimators look, but he has always been on the, the weaker side of the batted ball outcome distribution. He's never been really good at um, limiting some of those. I'm sorry. Well, yeah, yeah limiting some of the bad outcomes. And, and, you know, on the other side of that, like getting some of those good outcomes, <laughs> he's never been good at that. And on the EV influence side, you know, in terms of dampening <clears throat> hitters exit velocities, he's never been particularly good at that either. And, you know, it still sees him as a top 20 pitcher. That's really good. Um, there's really nothing to write home about there. But is he a top three pitcher based on FIP or a top four pitcher based on XFIP? You know, in this situation, based on the context, I am more inclined to trust PFIP. Um, than any of the other ones because I understand what PFIP is telling me about him more than the other ones are telling me about him. 
um, Nestor and Julio, um, big time location guys. They are probably the biggest beneficiaries from from this, and really serves to validate. Like I think this is like maybe they're the two like key critical examples here of showing why the existing framework kind of fails these guys. Fails these guys who have really interesting stuff, who do really good things with their location. Um, and are getting really good outcomes because of those things. And the existing framework just doesn't have the mechanisms in place to say, yeah, Julio is doing a great job of limiting exit velocity. He's doing a great job of getting pop-ups or ground balls or both. I think it's both. And same with Nestor. Um, so I really like PFIP for these guys who are finding diamonds in the rough where all of the other ERA estimators fail them, but it really validates the ERAs like, yeah, maybe Julio is not a top three ERA guy, but like to say that he was only 60th best by anything else is kind of crazy. Um, and I think when you find something like PFIP saying, yeah, at least he's 20th best or even 15th best, I can sleep better at night. Um, modified PFIP again, like that list is pretty much the same, but you do see Tyler Anderson bubble up. Tyler Anderson became obviously a very interesting name. Um, when he be, when he went to the Dodgers and then became very good. Um, he has always had the skills. Um, he had the skills in Coors. It's just that Coors betrayed him. He probably didn't have the right pitching, like no pitching coaches in Coors either. But he always did have some semblance of, you know, strikeout stuff, at least a little bit. And he was always a pretty good exit velocity guy. Um, and over the last like three or four years, he's probably one of the five best exit velocity guys and that's not just because of his stint with the dodgers that goes back to course too so it's always been there and i don't want to like pat myself on the back and say that's what the dodgers saw in him but almost certainly that's what the dodgers saw in him they saw a guy who has like pretty good skills not too much better than like the average pitcher um pretty good control um but they saw a guy who has the stuff um to really kind of dampen opposing hitters exit velocities and it, it became fruitful in a really big way for the Dodgers last year. So um, when we're talking about like the angels signing him and hoping for the best, um, you know, unless they did something really, really bad to him, it'll probably be more of the same because this is a skill he already owns. So, um, you know, maybe there's a little bit of regression toward the league average. Maybe he's going to be more of a PFIP guy than a, than a modified PFIP guy. And that sounds just so silly the way I'm describing it, but you know, he's, he's good. He was always good. It was just a matter of getting out of cores. And that is not what we can say about Herman Marquez. So um, again, this is something that I talked about earlier. I'm just going to put it here again. Was it ever a launch angle revolution? I don't think so. I think it was just a pitch height revolution. Um, but again, some final notes. Um, and these are a lot of things to just consider because we can talk for days about this topic. It's really important to define fly balls more broadly than we currently do. We talk about fly balls typically as infield flies or infield pop-ups. Um, and there are so many pop-ups to the outfield that are easy fly ball catches um, that don't get quantified as pop-ups. So what we really need to do and what I've done for this actually uh, for this analysis is change the threshold for pop-ups to like 45 degrees or even 38 degrees, like only 5% of hits are i'm sorry five percent of batted balls above 38 degrees are are hits and only like half a percentage of those are home runs so like we're talking about a really large band of launch angles that are being excluded from pop-ups that really ought to be removed from the fly ball classification and put into the pop-up classification so that's something that i've done here and that's why it will probably be hard for you to replicate the results unless you know exactly what i did but I am defining pop-ups more broadly and rewarding pitchers for getting those easy fly ball outs because to me, those are pop-ups too. Something really important to remember, any launch angle is achievable at any pitch height. Launch angle is actually really hard to influence. I make it sound super easy. Just do pitch height, blah, 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 throw it high, throw it low, look at this guy, couch guy, he's never played baseball in his life, he thinks he knows everything. Look, I know that Launch angle is hard to, to influence. It is mostly just a game of probabilities. Like you just want to throw it high. You want to elevate your four seamer, bury your two seamer, bury your change up. You're just influencing the probability of an extreme launch angle outcome. Framber Valdez is not going to get 
a minus five degree ground ball every single time he throws it at the bottom of the zone. But he is going to improve his probability of getting a negative five degree angle, launch angle at the bottom of the zone if he's throwing it there consistently. So again, it, we're, we're talking about a game of probabilities, which baseball has always been. And lastly, before I run out of time, pitch height is definitely not the only thing. I know that. Um, stuff matters. Vertical approach angle is super important. Again, I talked about Framber Valdez having steeper stuff than most guys out there who are living down in the zone. Um, Christian Javier has like a unicorn fastball, as it's been described. Um, you know, Justin Ver Verlander has a very flat fastball and he elevates it. Like these are, these are, again, are the confluence of factors coming together to create really optimal outcomes. Um, so it's not just height. You know, height is one thing, but your run-of-the-mill average pitcher is not going to benefit just from elevating his fastball all the time. He needs some characteristics that we're, are going to set him apart or else he's probably still just going to give up a lot of home runs. Um, and also horizontal location matters, um, you know, in and out. Um, typically, the more you deviate from the heart of the zone on a horizontal you know, on a lateral basis, the, the, the shallower the launch angle. So if you're, if you're working in and out, you're going to get a few more ground balls than you would if you were just like going up and down, um, it, you know, in the heart of the zone, but that's, that's somewhat immaterial. Um, it really is mostly pitch height. Um, so I'm out of breath. I was watching the questions come in kind of, I'm not really sure there were any questions. Um, but if anyone has any questions, they can leave them in the chat box. Maybe, I can address them before this is over, but otherwise I'll invite Nick back into the room to interrupt me and tell me how bad this was. Nick, where are you? Come save me. Never. I'll never save. No, uh, that was, that was fantastic. Um, I mean, yeah, I think the, uh, the biggest thing I had wrote down was you were talking about pitch height more so to pop-ups and to, um, and to do grounders. Uh, it's interesting because, yeah, we think about, you know, ground ball pitchers being a good thing, the Kluber formula and all of that, but Scherzer had the lowest ground ball rate, right? Um, and that's obviously the pop-ups and stuff. I do wonder, uh, so, I mean, I, I guess you're just kind of, you're, you're extending the definition of a pop-up, which I think is correct. Um, it's more of just about like acknowledging the launch angle and the exit velocity, and then using that to say like, this is a likely out versus this is not likely an out really um and i'm for that i mean i wrote down what i wrote is fly ball exit velocity and pitch height and can we influence that like is there a change between it um lower in the zone versus higher in the zone that is better or not do we know that yeah and i think it's going to just depend on the stuff like i think that yeah. becomes a stuff question like if you're throwing if again, so that was kind of like what I was trying to get at was if you're elevating, but you don't have the right stuff to elevate, mm -hmm. you're going to be allowing the harder exit velocities up. Yeah, in the zone. right. And if, if your stuff isn't steep at the bottom of the zone, you're still going to get more ground balls, but you're still going to be prone to line drives and stuff. Like it really, <clears throat> like the only, <laughs> you know, stuff is still super important and location is location is most important but like having unique stuff like i that's like the one thing that i always come back to aside from the launch angle stuff is like the best way to set yourself apart is by having unique characteristics like whether that's a unique a unique um pitch shape or even a unique release point which a lot of these things are all related right but like you know having guys who throw from a sidearm and create like a really flat fastball plane just by virtue of having a low release point like these are things you can do to set yourself apart that help the location play up and vice versa. Like the location plays up the stuff. So um, mm -hmm. there's definitely like the EV component plays in when it comes to stuff. And I think like that's, you know, when you're talking about Julio, when you're talking about Sandy, like those are the guys who, who have the location and have the stuff to make all that play up together. Right. Um, how dare you put Sandy that low? I just want to tell you that right now. Uh, <laughs> With, uh, Look, no. it's the computer. It's not me. Yeah, it's the computer. There you go. It's not you. Uh, no, um, Tyler Anderson, obviously, I have to mention the change of difference. 
um, as well being a huge thing um, for this year. And maybe they also were like, hey, like your changeup's really good and we know how to make it better and all of this stuff too that would play into it. But to see him at 20, wow, that's that's kind of interesting. Maybe those skills that he learned with the Dodgers does stick around uh, with the Angels. And I will not be an Alex Cobb believer. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I don't oh yeah, his name was on the list too. Yeah, I, I saw yeah. that one too, and it was giving me a little bit of heartburn. I didn't. I, there's a reason why I didn't highlight his name, because um, I he's st I'm still a little skeptical. Yeah, right. <laughs> can't, can't win them all. Can't win them all. I um, mean, also we'll keep see. in mind uh, with this stuff too. You're highlighting, hey, look, grounders effective, but the Astros' defense is great. The Dodgers' defense great. The Giants actually were a really bad defense last year. Mm -hmm. um, something yeah. to consider with that. Um, it's really hard to know also that the Arizona Diamondbacks had a great defense last year before last year started. Yeah, uh, right. And those those are influences. We like to say FIP is feeling independent, but then ERA is defense defense dependent, right? So right, exactly. Um, it's hard to to detail that. Um, last question is uh, how how hot are you right now? I feel good. I feel you good. Feel I was good? really nervous. I was I was nervous because I was like I didn't practice. Uh, yeah. I wrote this all last night. Mm -hmm. um all the this numbers are made up this is completely sure, yeah. fabricated yep uh, no i'm just kidding but um no no i'm feeling good uh i saw yancey ask how how cold could it possibly be here um i think it's in like the the, the high 60s which is like you know relatively yeah, that's, speaking that's basically that's frigid, fair. right Don't do that to me okay it's basically so you are not fair. taking off your shirt uh fir tree you want to yeah sorry uh sorry for those that bet against it um but Alex, thank you so much for this. This is fantastic. Uh, is this going to be on the pitch leaderboard? I will put it on the pitch leaderboard when I have a chance to do so. Which All is right. Not anytime soon, but it will be there somewhat soon before the fantastic. season starts. <laughs> that sounds great. Uh, Alex, thanks so much for being part of PitchCon once again. And also we're revealing a stat for what, like the third year in a row? Something like that? I know. It's so cliche. I love it. It's so cliche. Oh, by the, the way, I have Jordan. Better. Uh, in the Jordan Rosenbaum, in the um, uh, to bring him on. No, right now I'm just kidding. Uh, how dare you come up with an ERA estimator? I uh, all right, Alex. Thanks so much for being a part of PitchCon. Uh, I wouldn't feel like an event without you. So thanks for being here. Oh, thanks, Nick.